Okay. Is that okay? Is that coming through to you now? Yes, is that okay? Okay. okay. I guess I'll leave it on now. Treasure, take this life. Everything's on the altar now. 
No holding back, no holding out In view of your matchless sacrifice Take every treasure, take this life Well, good evening, everyone, uh, and a very warm welcome to the Good Shepherd tonight. It's good to have you with us, um, those of you who are here in the building and those of you who are watching on the live stream as well. It's good to have you with us. Um, so this is an event organized by Churches Together in Carl Shulton uh, and hosted here at the Good Shepherd. So I'm Kevin. I'm the vicar here. If you don't know who I am and you're wondering, I mean, in some ways it's fairly obvious, but, you know, you never know. Um, so it's really good to welcome Neville here from Aid to the Church in Need. Uh, he's going to talk to us about uh, religious persecution and what it means uh, in today's world and issues about freedom and that kind of thing. And in uh, my brief conversations with Neville uh, this evening, I've learned that he's been doing this for about 30 years. He's been to about 30 different countries and supported Christians around the world. So uh, he's uh, very experienced in knowing what he's talking about. Uh, so we're looking forward to hearing hearing uh, some more from Neville and there will be opportunity for some questions afterwards uh, so if he does say anything that sparks it off in your mind uh, then do make a note of it uh, to ask later. Um, before I hand over I'm going to pray for us this evening so let's pray. Lord God, we thank you that we can meet here in freedom and without fear. And we thank you for the different church communities that we represent tonight. And we pray that uh, you would be here by your Holy Spirit to uh, help us to hear what we need to hear so that we can act and we can pray and we can support and we pray for Neville as he speaks to us that you would uh, inspire him in his words. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin, very much. And it's a great pleasure to be here and to see some familiar faces and to make new friends. And uh, just to add to what Kevin said, in some ways this is a local but international charity, Aid to the Church Need, when I started back in 1991. The offices had just been set up in uh, Sutton on Car Shorten Road, so in the deanery. Um, and uh, in many ways over the years, we've had absolutely wonderful support from this area and from different parts of the UK. And indeed, this office is one of 23 national offices around the world making people aware of what people go through for their faith, for their Christian faith today, and raising funds to bring aid to the church in need. Now, my topic tonight is religious freedom. What does it mean in today's world? And it's a tricky concept to define. However, one of the benchmarks which is often quoted for religious freedom is Article 18, of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. You might not be able to read that, so I will read that out. Everyone has the right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. This right includes freedom to change his religion or belief, and freedom either alone or in his community with others, and in public or private, to manifest his religion or belief in teaching, practice, worship, and observance. Drafted in 1948, it was a strong statement addressed to a world which had just come out of the years of war. Fresh in the drafter's mind were the horrors of the Holocaust committed against the Jewish people by the Nazi regime. And perhaps also the experience of religious believers in the gulags of the USSR. I think we all know that between 1941 and 45, in just four short years, six million Jews were killed, 
around two-thirds of Europe's Jewish community. Many of them were systematically murdered in the gas chambers set up during the period that the National Socialist German Workers' Party ran the country. Perhaps less well-known is Alexander Solzhenitsyn's estimate that up to 60 million people could have died in the Soviet prisons and gulags from 1917 to 1953. Up to 60 million people, he said. The communists sent prisoners to toil in labor in temperatures of down to minus 68 degrees, knowing that the elements would do their work. It is thought that half of those who were sent to the camps were Christians. So, in all probability, somewhere around 30 million Christians may have died over more than three decades. Those figures boil down to just over 1.5 million deaths per annum in Soviet state detention of whatever kind, although probably the gulags accounted for much of it. Across the USSR, between the revolution and the death of Stalin, I have visited a number of the gulags in Russia, and indeed one Karlag in Kazakhstan. And reflecting on my visit to Auschwitz, I can only say that there was a similar feel, a frozen wasteland of death with that silent, eternal depth. Article 18 was by no means uncontroversial at the time, and it still attracts debate but part of its intention was to ensure that never again would people be victimized by the state or even lose their lives just because of their religion. And it laid the foundation for freedom of religion or belief to be enshrined in international law in the latter half of the 20th century. In the UK, the Human Rights Act of 1998 enshrined many of these ideas, and as the language used, you'll see, is very close to that found in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Everyone has the right to freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. This right includes freedom to change his religion or belief and freedom, either alone or in community with others, and in public or private, to manifest his religion or belief in worship, teaching, practice, and observance. Now, we might ask, why, as Christians, should we believe in religious freedom? Well, obviously, we would never want to see a reputation of the situations we have mentioned. When we hear, for example, the persecution of the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church under the communists and the priests that were sent to the gulags, our hearts go out to our brothers and sisters who suffered. The persecution of the church in Ukraine, which I visited many times, started soon after communist troops seized the country in 1939. Monasteries, schools, and other institutions were suppressed. Seminaries were closed, and the church's land and property were nationalized. Traditional religious holidays, which had been celebrated for centuries, were cancelled, becoming normal work days. Out of around 2,000 Ukrainian priests, 740 were imprisoned, deported, or went into hiding. Many of those taken by the authorities were sent to the gulags. Similarly, I expect we are moved when we hear about the atrocities that our elder brothers and sisters in the faith of Abraham suffered under the Nazis, both because we were shocked on a human level by the horrors they were subjected to, and also because of the bond we have in the great spiritual inheritance we share with the Jewish people. And I stood next to destroyed synagogues in Belarus and elsewhere, remembering the people of faith who were deported and died. But the call for religious freedom is a call for us to respect, and we have to remember this, the right for those who earnestly and genuinely believe in things that we may strongly disagree with. Why should we support religious freedom for these groups? 
Well, both Catholic and evangelical thinkers appeal to the dignity of the human person. The dignity of the human person comes from us having been created in the image and likeness of God. In the book of Genesis, it is related how God made humanity, and it describes how, having made man and woman as the pinnacle of creation, God blessed us. Then God said, let us make man in our own image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him, male and female he created them. Having created humanity in his own image and likeness, God endowed our first parents with intelligence and freedom and placed them over all creation. Pope St. John the Twenty-Third saw this proclaimed in the Psalms, referencing Psalm 8, verses 5 to 6, where it says, Thou hast made him a little less than the angels. Thou hast crowned him with glory and honor, and hast set him over the works of thy hands. Thou hast subjected all things under his feet. We are not mere creatures. Rather, we have been made to be like God. Although this is a journey, a pilgrimage towards the perfection of our Heavenly Father, rather than something we automatically have. The World's Evangelical, World Evangelical Alliance's International Institute for Religious Freedom state, states that all its activities are founded on Scripture, which reveals that every human being is created in the image of God and thus has indelible dignity. That idea is also one of the foundations of the Catholic Church's Declaration of Religious Liberty, Dignitatis Humanae, uh, from 1965, which states that the right to religious freedom has its foundation in the very dignity of the human person, as this dignity is known through the revealed word of God and by reason itself. The World Evangelical Alliance spells out an important point when it says, and emphasizes, as I mentioned earlier, that it differentiates between advocating the rights of members of other or no religions and endorsing the truth of their beliefs. Advocating the freedom of others can be done without accepting the truth of what they believe. So even if we might not agree with what members of a particular religion believe or do, nevertheless, when these are genuine beliefs, causing no harm to society, then they should be free to practice their faith without fear of retribution or coercion. And the Catholic Church's Declaration on Religious Liberty stresses this point when it says, religious freedom in turn, which men demand as necessary to fulfill their duty to worship God, has to do with immunity from coercion in civil society. This freedom means that all men are to be immune from coercion on the part of individuals or of social groups and of any human power in such wise that no one is to be forced to act in a manner contrary to his own beliefs, whether privately or publicly, whether alone, in association with others, within due limits. And yet we know, despite the aspirations of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the prophetic vision of the Christian churches. Nevertheless, religious believers are subject to coercion and worse. Indeed, Christians often subject to persecution, intimidation and duress. As I mentioned, Aid to the Church in Need, the charity I've had the honor of heading up now here in the UK for 30 years helps Christians where they are persecuted, suffering, or in pastoral need. Therefore, after this essential background, I will now be focusing on the situations mainly facing our suffering Christian brothers and sisters. Of course, in many of the countries I focus on, there are other religious minorities who will also be suffering, as regimes and extremist groups target those 
whose views are different from their own. Indeed, the two main drivers of persecution are intolerant regimes, such as China, and militant extremist groups. These present the biggest threats to the free exercise of religious beliefs. Communist China remains one of the world's worst countries for imprisoning members of religious groups, as you will know well from all you've heard. I remember visiting China and speaking to bishops in the underground Catholic Church who had suffered because of their faith. And these problems continue today. In May this year, authorities arrested the 63-year-old Bishop Joseph Zhang Weizhou of Xinjiang, just 24 hours after 100 police officers raided an underground seminary before detaining seven priests and 10 seminarians. I remember visiting a shrine which was torn down not long after I'd visited. I remember visiting the hidden tombs of Christians, which you were only allowed to visit with the express permission of the authorities, and then being taken away afterwards, my passport confiscated. While there has been a new clampdown in China, many religious leaders have also been detained for many years, like Bishop James Zhu Jimin of Baoding, seized by authorities in 1996 for holding an illegal religious procession, this year Bishop James will have been in prison for a quarter of a century. Similarly in other parts of the world, in Eritrea for example, the state has a track record of imprisoning Christians. Unregistered house churches are among the most vulnerable. And although around 30 evangelical Christians were released last year in Eritrea in an act of amnesty, hundreds still remain behind bars. And even established denominations like the Eritrean Orthodox Tawahedo Church have been targeted. The church's head, Patriarch Antonius, was placed under house arrest in 2007 following his refusal to excommunicate 3,000 members of his church and protests he made to the government over the imprisonment of Christians. The state then orchestrated his removal as the head of the church, but no formal charges have been brought against him and he remains a prisoner. One of the areas of the world which you'll be aware of where Christians have suffered appallingly in recent years in particular has been the Middle East. Here the intolerance of militant extremist groups has seen a massive exodus of Christians occurring as the church was driven out of its ancient biblical heartland, our biblical heartland. Christians in Syria have suffered along with everyone else and we're receiving further reports of Christians being driven out of Syria this week. Because of the civil war and the ongoing conflict and tension. But they've also been targeted by extremist groups and extremists amongst the rebel groups opposed to the government. I visited Lebanon a good number of times, and on the Aid to Church and Need project, we met with refugees from Syria, very close to the border in Lebanon's Bekaa Valley. One of the people who met with ACM was Elias Gargous, who with 15 other members of his family, cousins, nephews, and nieces, were living at that time in one cramped room with a small adjoining kitchen come bathroom. Elias's nightmare, Elias's nightmare began when the rebel military group Al Nusra Front seized him and his 23-year-old nephew close to their home in western Syria. Elias told us, we were taken bound and gagged to a convent which Islamists had captured, where we watched helpless as they smashed icons in front of us. They were told, and these are his words, Christians are pigs, you don't deserve to live. Their captors repeatedly invited them to convert to Islam. But Elias's nephew told their captors, we would not be afraid to die for Jesus. Their lives, unlike those of many others, were spared. 
but the rebel militia demanded a ransom of £14,000. Family had to sell all of their possessions, including their fruit farm, which was their livelihood to raise the money. With nothing left for them in Syria, and afraid that as Christians they might be targeted again, they crossed the border to Lebanon, seeking sanctuary in Zaleh in the Bekar Valley, where the Melkite church, with ACN's help, is providing lodging, food, rent and heating, and even medicine for Elias' daughter, Celine, who has severe diabetes. The UN, and I can tell you this, I visited these camps in the Bekar Valley, has been providing help to the camps, which were set up, but the only particular faith group staying in these camps was, were those of the Muslim faith. Many of them, I was told by local people, the families of ISIS fighters. But the Christians were living outside of the unofficial camps. So the church was, and really to a large extent, remains the only source of aid. When I visited Zale, and I've been there, I think, four times now, and I've met with Christian refugees in their tiny cramped homes, and ACN is helping now through St. John the Merciful table to feed between 1,200 and 1,600 people every day. It is the stories that they tell me which I will never forget. I remember one story from a family who fled from Zabadani, and they told me how, just close to the border, they locked their houses, and at night, the knocks on the door would come saying, where are you Christians, come out. Girls were taken away, raped, and they were never seen again. The horrors were such that they had to flee their homes as soon as they could. And when they told their stories, many of these refugees, what struck me was how like they were to me, to you and I, living a relatively comfortable life when all this happened. I say that, you might ask why, because I remember one lady with tears in her eyes recalling a lovely bathroom she had in a, in a house in her garden, a little garden with a fountain, and now she was living in a tiny cell-like room crammed in with her family. But above all, the one thing that challenged me and stood out for me was the faith of the people I met with. One grandmother, Muntaha, who had fled the terror, whose whole house had been destroyed by the ISIS terrorists, she and her husband had lost everything, smiled and she summed up the inspirational faith and said, well, we have the faith of Jesus and Mary, we are still alive. Archbishop Isam John Darwish, a good friend, the Melkite Archbishop of Zale and Ferzold, said, I wish to encourage the people of Britain to help the Christians in the Middle East, their brothers and sisters who are facing such difficulties and suffering. We need the presence of Christians in the Middle East and diversity and dialogue between Christians and Muslims. A sheikh said to me, if you Christians leave, we Muslims will live in darkness, the light will go out. He extended his personal thanks, and I've heard the same thing from sheikhs and imams. The presence of the Christians as a building block, sometimes as a bridge builder, sometimes as a buffer in the Middle East, is absolutely vital. It's almost impossible with the terrorists, with the radicals, the fundamentalist Islamists. But with other communities, Christians are the true builders and the ones who are turned to. Iraq has faced similar problems to Syria. The community, as you know, has suffered from extremist attacks following the fall of Saddam Hussein. I visited the grave of this priest photographed here at his shrine as it's becoming, Father Raghi Ghani. He was murdered when he was 35 years old, 35 years of age. He was actually nicknamed by the Irish, because he was at the Irish College in Rome, Father Paddy. Um, and they told him he should go back to Ireland and work in Ireland. But he said, no, I have to go back and be with my people. He was the pastor of the church of the Holy Spirit in Mosul. 
The church had been attacked a number of times in 2007. And the bombings were continuing. One of his last messages was, we hope to carry our cross to the very end with the help of divine grace. And on the 3rd of June, 2007, the first Sunday after Pentecost, Father Ragid was killed along with three subdeacons as they were getting into their car to go home following the Sunday service. The wife of one of the subdeacons told the story. They forced us to get out of the car and they led me away. Then one of the killers screamed at Father Ragid, I told you to close the church. Why didn't you do it? Why are you still here? And he simply responded, How can I close the house of God? They immediately pushed him to the ground and Father Ragid only had enough time to gesture to me with his head that I should run away. Then they opened fire. Note his words, how can I close the house of God? Not the church, the house of God. That is for everyone, the house of God. He could not close and would not close the doors of the house of God. In 2018, I was deeply moved to be able to visit his grave in Karamalesh near Mosul. And the attacks following that in the summer of 2014 saw Daesh's, ISIS's genocidal drive across Iraq and was a tragedy for the country's religious minorities and saw the campaign against Christians being stepped up. There was, as you may recall, a mass exodus from the Nineveh plains, towns and villages and most Christians fled to Erbil, the Kurdish capital. At least 120,000 fled north. Displaced families were housed wherever they could be. And on one of my trips to Iraq, when we visited Erbil, I spoke to a woman called Naraman. And given all she had gone through, I asked this young woman, I said, have you got hope? As I looked at this tiny room, which she and her family were crammed into in this half-built office block where they'd been given rooms to survive and somehow come through the trauma. And she replied, hope? Of course we have hope. We have hope in Jesus. I felt that put me utterly in my place. But she then went on to say that she and her family of seven feared they'd never be able to return to Karakosh near Mosul. And to me, it's an amazing miracle of ecumenical cooperation that the churches in Iraq, including the Chaldean, Syriac Orthodox and Syriac Catholic Church have come together to help displaced Christians. ACN was there in a major way. Other charities have worked there. Of course, it wasn't just the Christians who suffered. You will know that amongst the other religious minorities targeted by the extremists were, in a particularly appalling way, the members of the Yazidi faith. But I remember in that same half-built office block, meeting an old Yazidi lady, and I sat on the floor on the carpet with her, the 78-year-old lady. She held my hand and she said, if it wasn't for Abuna, for Father Najib, I wouldn't be here. He saved my life. And a number of Yazidi families fled to Erbil, where with the Christians, again supported by Aid to the Church in Need and other charities, they were helped. I feel very often, and it's a great privilege as I say to work for this charity, if it wasn't for the friends and benefactors of Aid to the Church in Need, these Christians would have not received any help. They did not and they could not rely on the help of governments abroad. The aid was not reaching them for one reason or another. ACN has helped nearly half of the Christians now return to the Nineveh Plains. We've helped with an orphanage. We're helping with a school. We've helped rebuild churches, including some of those which the Pope visited on his recent visit. And we've helped with the reconstruction of so many homes, and I would say, above all, of hope. One other little story, if I may. I asked when I was in 
Karamalesh, where Gazella lived. I'd met her in Ankawa in Erbil, aged 84, and she had fled with her dear friend Victoria, who's now very ill. And I found her in her small cave-like stone home on this street with the rubble, which you can see there. And she told a story to some priests who were with me, with me at the time, how she had refused at gunpoint to convert to Islam. She said, I believe in the love and forgiveness of God. And on this occasion, she summed up her faith and the importance of it. So we are living with the faith. Without faith, we can't go on. Briefly now, before I draw to a conclusion, and I can't, you will understand quite rightly, cover the whole world in a talk such as this, but I'd like to highlight a few cases from elsewhere which we're focusing on, in particular at Aid to the Church in Need, through Red Wednesday activities late November, through our advocacy work with engagement now with politicians and petitions, somehow to raise awareness of what is going on, working indeed with Open Doors and Christian Solidarity Worldwide, and indeed with the UK Forb Forum, which I'm involved with on the steering committee, the Freedom of Religious, Religion or Belief Forum, with peoples of other faiths and none, talking about the right to religious freedom and the importance of it. But in Africa in particular, I must mention what is happening in Nigeria, because many of you will know about that. Indeed, maybe from some of the priests who are now in this deanery as well. And in Nigeria, the Christians and others have faced extremist attacks from Boko Haram. No parts of society seem to be immune from this suffering, but there these extremists of Boko Haram have made no secret of their intention to drive Christians from the region. Even in 2012, Boko Haram stated publicly they were conducting a war on Christians. In a video message, they said, we will create so much effort to have an Islamic state that Christians will not be able to stay. They will not tolerate any opposition to their own interpretation of Islam. They've attacked mosques where imams have public, publicly spoken out against them. In 2020 alone, it's estimated that 3,000 Christians were killed in Nigeria by militant groups. I've read some figures for this year which say it's something similar already. We, will, we can't be sure about that. And some people say the 3,000 is probably about a tenth of the reality of those who died. The numbers are unbelievable. Boko Haram have also kidnapped girls and young women, forcing them to marry their members. And the forced marriage of Christians has been accompanied by coercion to convert to Islam and compulsion to enter into sexual relations. One such tragic case is that of 14-year-old Leah Sharibu, who was seized by Boko Haram over three years ago. Leah was one of 110 schoolgirls kidnapped by Boko Haram when the extremists attacked the government science and technical college in Dapchi, Yobi State, on the morning of 19th February 2018. For most of those girls, there was a happy ending when, on Wednesday 21st of March 2018, most of the students returned to Dapchi following negotiations by the government. In fact, it transpired that 104 of the girls had been brought back but, and we hear this from the, some of the survivors, they said five girls were killed on their journey to the extremist camps, and one was kept, the sixth girl, Leah Sharibu, who refused to cooperate. She was reportedly the only Christian amongst that group. Rebecca Sharibu, who we know, Leah's mother, was bereft, absolutely distraught. She could not find her daughter and among the students who had been brought back. And she asked two of Leah's friends where her daughters were. And this is her report. The girls told her, Boko Haram told Leah to accept Islam and she refused. So they said she would not come with us 
and she should go and sit back down with the three other girls they had there. We begged her just to recite the Islamic declaration and put the hijab on and get into the vehicle. But she said it was not her faith, so why should she say it was? If they want to kill her, they can go ahead, but she won't say she is a Muslim. Leah still is in captivity. There are rumors she had been converted to Islam, married a Boko Haram commander, and now given birth to a baby boy. Her mother said, we don't know if this, if this is really true. And if it is true, no problem, I still love her. The only thing paramount is for my daughter to be back. She added that she would welcome the baby too. The Reverend Gidea Paramalam, an evangelical pastor who's close to the family, said, would force conversion to Islam in captivity be considered a willing conversion? No. Let us pray for her to remain steadfast in her faith in Christ, even at this dark hour when the trial of her faith is being stretched to limits that even adults won't easily face. Please do keep Leah and all who are being held by extremist groups in your prayers. So, religious freedom, as we have heard tonight, as we know well, continues to be denied to hundreds and thousands of Christians and indeed members of other faiths around the world. Whether the problem is repressive regimes or extremist groups, Nevertheless, we find individual believers unable to go about their business without the fear of reprisals of whatever nature. As I mentioned, ACN engages in advocacy, highlighting incidents like this, the ones I've described, and calling on politicians to take action in these cases. In the UK, despite the goodwill from many quarters within the government, there seems to be an overall failure to understand the significance of religion in the lives of so many people around the world. I've been, I remember in particular in one embassy, where the, what I can only call the religious illiteracy was quite extraordinary of those in post. And this has to be challenged. It has to be challenged in the FCDO. You cannot understand the world if you don't understand religion. For 80 to 90% of people, religion is part of who they are. Their faith is part of their very identity. The Anglican Bishop of Truro, Philip Mount Stephen, was asked by Jeremy Hunt to set up a review for the FCO, the persecution of Christians, and aid to the church in need contributed in a major way to that. And the conclusion in the report was that there was an apparent paucity of awareness of the challenges facing the Christian community within the FCO, which reveals a lack of religious literacy that undoubtedly impacts the full exercise of all freedom of religion of belief, all four rights. And that report, that review made recommendations to the FCO on steps it should take to tackle these problems. There was a meeting the other day, and I can't say again with who, at the FCDO, and this term was raised in discussion by them because they didn't like it. But we said, again, how can you understand what is going on if you do not understand religion? Christians and other minority religious groups not only suffer from persecution and oppression, but I'm sad to say governments in the West are still slow to realize that your religious faith can make you more vulnerable to targeting or attacks. We think of some of the girls in Pakistan, Mara Shabazz and others, who've been forcibly converted, raped and married, and whose cases we are raising at the highest level at the present time. Let us pray for our suffering brothers and sisters. I'd ask, please, if you want to get more involved, next month is holding its annual Red, Red Wednesday event 
at ACN is hosting out on Wednesday the 24th of November. Indeed, online or at the back here today, we have some nice red hats and scarves using red to symbolize the blood of those who suffer. And if you'd like to know more about our work, reaching out to those who are suffering today and about Red Wednesday, go to acnuk.org, www.acnuk.org and for Red Wednesday forward slash Red Wednesday. I would like to stress once again, from my visits around the world, in particular, I would say, over 30 odd years in Syria, Iraq, Egypt and Lebanon, in our biblical homelands, that that vital witness of Christians is essential to peace, to building up of different communities, to the hope for the people who inhabit those lands. We must think of the missing and the martyred. We must think of those who have died. I think of, for example, Father Vans van der Luuk, Father Franz van der Luuk, the old Jesuit who'd been in Syria for 50 years. 75 years old, he engaged in dialogue with everyone. And he was killed outside his house in Homs in April 2014. He pleaded that hatred, struggle, and pain would stop. In the midst of all this suffering, Christians from across denominational divides have found themselves, as I said earlier, sharing that experience of persecution and exile, but also amongst ourselves working with a new sense of unity, helping to restore homes, doing so much together, helping encourage hope, working together to proclaim the hope of Christ. The need to promote form, the right to freedom of religion or belief, is a key building block in our world today, in our divided world. Governments, to reiterate, may say they respect and even sign up to the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights, but the reality is that in so many parts of the world, the right to believe is undermined and religious minorities suffer appalling persecution and oppression. Thank you for listening to me this evening. Thank you, Neville, uh, for that. Uh, such a lot to think about, isn't there? Um, and so now's an opportunity, if you would like to, to ask any questions, uh, preferably questions that are personal and relevant to our conversation <laughs> rather than anything random. Although random makes us laugh, so why not just ask a random question? Uh, but uh, has anyone got a question that they'd like? My glamorous assistant, David, is going to roam with the microphone. Um, uh, so don't be shy. first one is always the hardest. <laughs> I'm going to hold it for me. Okay. Can you turn this? Can I speak to Neville? Thank you. <laughs> okay. Turn a bit. Um, yeah. Uh, okay. I'm Alex. I'm uh, secretary of um, Churches Together. So I'm st Thank kicking you. it off. And uh, what comes to my mind is a two-part question is, one, how can I help... Uh, persecuted Christians around the world? And secondly, how can churches together in Carl Shalton help persecuted Christians around the world? Thank you. Well, I'd like to say I'm sure you already are by praying. And um, I, I, I remember a story just to tell, how, tell you how important that is. I remember a Sudanese sister speaking in Birmingham once at the Birmingham Oratory. And she was speaking about Sudan. And um, she said she was being bombed on one occasion in a village there. And the children were running to her and saying, sister, sister, we're going to die. And she said, they 
came round and they, she cuddled them. And she said, it was then that I realized that we're in a link, a chain of faith, hope, and charity linked one to another in faith around the world. And funnily enough, I said to her, have you been to Newman's room? Now, St. John Henry Newman's room, which is the, the oratory. This was before his canonization. And she said, no. I said, well, on the back of his wardrobe, he had a map of Sudan. Um, and some of you may know, the dream of Grontius was found, even a copy of that. General Gordon had that just before he died, and the, the copy of that was brought back here. And for me, that faith linking us together is absolutely essential. When I've been on visits over, eight, over the years to eight, with Aid to the Church in Need, we were sitting somewhere where people have nothing, the church has been destroyed, um, and they'll be offering everything they have and tea and uh, some lovely local cakes or something. And I say, what would you like? And they say, prayer. And again, what would you like? Prayer. Third time, what would you like? Prayer. That is the first place. And I would say, we founded AIDS Church in Eden and developed on prayer, information, and action. Pray, but please inform others to take it to the next part. Tell others. People are not aware. Um, when we were working in the Soviet Union, the Eastern Bloc, before, people didn't even believe us as aid to the church. And when we said this, many people were suffering for their faith and being killed. It was only when the Iron Curtain came down, they realized what was going on. And in the same way, I think there's a mental, almost spiritual block that people don't want to know what others are going through for their faith today. So we need to inform and engage um, and act. We can act through Red Wednesday events, wearing red, lighting churches up red. I think the Foreign Office or the FCDO is going to light red again. They signed up to Red Wednesday following the Bishop of Truro's um, uh, report. But we need much more than that. And we at Aid to the Church in Need are providing aid to the Church in Need. And I can tell you in Lebanon at the moment, we're just committed in internationally providing more help. And there's aid I proved the other day on behalf of the trustees to help those in Zale again, refugees in the poor of Lebanon. And Lebanon is such a terrible situation. There are a million Christians in Lebanon and we need to support their presence. As I say, they are the building block. So I would say, pray, yes, inform and act. Um, and we can do that together. We have many, many supporters of, of, of different traditions at Aid to the Church in Need. And we work, as I say, with others such as Open Doors, Christian Solidarity Worldwide in particular on, uh, on Christian issues, but others of different faiths as well. But thank you for the questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, you've mentioned Christian Solidarity Worldwide. Well, I've been a volunteer with them for quite a few years now, and indeed I was with them uh, today. And one of the things we do is to publish contact details where it's safe to do so of people who are suffering persecution and encourage our people to write to them. And we've had some very good feedback from people who have really been strengthened and inspired by the fact that they've known that people here have been praying for them because people here have written to them and told them that they're praying for them. Yeah. And one of the things that will be going on in the next month or so is uh, people will be writing Christmas cards. And I know of churches where that there are groups who yeah. are sitting writing Christmas cards that they will send into CSW that they will then send out to folk. So that's another way one can do it. Let them know you're praying as well as just praying because it's such a strength. Yeah. <clears throat> and I had a meeting, some of you will know Mervyn Thomas. Merv, I know very well. I travelled with him to Egypt and uh, was a good friend. And I think that engagement and where we can work, we talked about particular cases together. And it's key we work together more and more where we can to speak with one voice. Speak with one voice to tell the people they're not forgotten and speak with one voice to government to say, this is not enough. You can't just have a tick box exercise um, and say, oh yes, uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, yes, but then forget religious freedom. <laughs> so, um, but no, thank you for that very much indeed. Thank you. Further, further questions? Um, I'll, I'll ask a question myself. <laughs> um, I was wondering about North Korea. 
I mean, mm. op in open doors have that as their one where Christians are persecuted more than anyone. Probably not very clear what's happening there, but I didn't know if you've got any reflections about North Korea. Well, I, I would say for the reports, which I think you can access on the acnuk.org website, there's a religious freedom report, which covers most of the, actually all the world, uh, which you can access through there. I'm pretty sure it's still up there. And also our report on the persecution of Christians. You can look in more detail. Um, but the, the stories which have which we come out of North Korea absolutely appalling still about what happens to Christians and the death of Christians. It's probably still the number one place in the world where to be a Christian is to risk your life. Um, and I've been to South Korea and spoken with the bishops there, and we've actually got an office of aid to the church in South Korea. And I, I know, um, and I, I'll be careful what I say, but there are contacts and there are ways of trying to reach people to help them. And that does happen and has happened in years gone by across the border from China as well. Um, and there are some signs from the meetings of friends and Lord Alton, uh, David Alton, who was on the board of aid to the church in need for a good number of years, uh, heads up the all-party parliamentary group on North Korea. Um, he, he spoke about how when he traveled there, there's somebody who gave a sign that they were a Christian, but very much in secret. So again, I would say pray. It's very hard to act at the moment. But I know the Christians in South Korea, Catholics and Protestants alike, are willing to act and help, and the whole universal church is, when, when we can. I, I just go back, one interesting thing is, sometimes people say to us, why do you not highlight particular cases? Why do you not say more on this? And we don't want to put the people who are trying to help at risk. Um, we want them to be still free to practice their faith, to encourage others in the faith. Um, and we have to be very careful. But I'm amazed over the years, in many cases, people say, we want you to tell people so that they're aware of the cost of discipleship, the cost of witnessing to the love of God today. Um, but we, don't, we cannot risk. And even sometimes when we get aid in, we say we can report so much, but we can't report too much. So um, some of our reports are a little bit edited, and it's not because we don't want to tell you or inform people, just because we don't want to put people at further risk. Thank you for that question. Thank you, uh, thank you Neville. Actually, fascinating talk. I think very inspiring. Um, two, uh, sort of two part, I suppose, as well in terms of examples. So, where maybe is is somewhere that. Um, is suffering very badly at the moment, but perhaps is not at the forefront of everyone's minds, perhaps one to particularly pray for, but 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 also I'd be interested in a, in a sort of more hopeful note as well of, of what maybe the, the greatest triumph you think you've, you've achieved over those years in, 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 save, in saving some area or people as well. Yeah. Uh, thank you. I, th I think picking up on what you say, as I heard it, sorry, with the echo, forgive me, but I, um, I would say I've been to Ukraine many times, and Ukraine is forgotten at the moment. There's a proxy war, or more than a proxy war going on. There are shootings, deaths every week on, on the front there with, with Russia. And um, there are people from Russia crossing the border fighting there. Um, but if you go back in Ukraine and the Ukrainian history, I mentioned it tonight. I remember standing at the, the mass graves of people who died there. And I gave tonight figures, and I, to give you a bit of hope, um, one, one, one bishop I know well, he said that in 1990, I get this right, I hope, there were 300 priests left, average age 70, in the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church. Now there are 3,000 priests, average age 38. And every one of those has been trained with the support of aid to the church in need. And I think it's, as in China, I remember a priest when I was at a very early service, uh, six o'clock in the morning in a little village, and the church was packed and said, how come? That's when I went to the hidden graves. He said, you know, it's the, the, the blood of the martyrs, the seed of Christians, the Arrhenius uh, phrase, but it's only through the flow of blood um, uh, that this new life has come to the church. Well, I think it's come through the blood of Christ. It's come through that witness. And... The Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church has, for instance, a Ukrainian Catholic University 
Orthodox and Catholics and uh, people of all denominations there. Um, and it's uh, engendering hope. But the suffering doesn't go away. <laughs> but uh, I think that's a sign of hope. The faith, the faith alive. And it's extraordinary when you see that. And I was in South... In, in Vietnam, I shouldn't say South Vietnam, in Vietnam, the other day I was reading one order of sisters, and I, I said, is this right? They've got, in one region, they've got 1,200 sisters, 1,200 sisters. And uh, in Vietnam, I think the communist authorities made a mistake at one stage. They weren't allowing priests, but they allowed the religious. So <laughs> these sisters are doing everything, and they were even helping, and the, the government actually asked them in to help in the hospitals because they didn't have enough people to help, help with COVID patients. And they gave a wonderful witness there, as we've seen also with many of the sisters in India and elsewhere. So, yeah, a lot of hope. A lot of, it's not just the cross, it's definitely the resurrection. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your questions, people. And uh, thank you, Neville. I think, I think informing people is so important because I think a lot of people in, in our country um, and even in our churches don't really understand that religious persecution is a thing, mm. um, apart from touchstone ethical issues in this country where people might feel they are persecuted. It's nothing like what people experience around the world. Um, and people just don't know. And so if we tell them, then they will understand um, that you know we have such freedom here to believe what we want, generally speaking, um, don't we, without anything yeah. else um, consequences. So thank you. Um, have you got anything else you'd like to say well, as just we close? On, either online, if you're watching online, please look at uh, the projects we're supporting, and particularly in Lebanon and elsewhere in the Middle East, I would stress, but so many parts of the world. And there's an ACN UK shop you can go to. And here in the church tonight, we have a very small shop <laughs> uh, with some items there. And if you want to know more about our work or feel like making a donation tonight, there, is, there are gift aid envelopes there. The envelopes you can use. We've got a credit card machine. Um, and cash as well, some Christmas cards. I'm sorry to mention Christmas, but uh, I, I find that these cards often we, we get images. When I've been on trips in Lebanon or John's been in Syria not long ago or Iraq, we've taken images from there and brought them and we try and surprisingly make them Christian, unlike some Christmas cards. So um, it's a way of also supporting the Christians in need around the world. So have a look and the Red Wednesday information is there. And, um, ideas, get involved, look online, but please, please do that. But I'd like to thank you very much and for, your, and for your questions and for those of you watching as well. Thank you, Kevin. It's a, a pleasure to be here. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. We give, can we give Neville another clap? Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I'll, I'll close our evening in prayer. Uh, so let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for... Um, for Neville, for Age of the Church in Need, and for what they are doing, uh, along with other um, charities uh, around the world, supporting our brothers and sisters. Um, we pray for those places that Neville has mentioned, uh, and those places that he knows of, uh, where there are particular needs at the moment. Um, we remember Nigeria, um, where it's particularly severe at the moment, but so many places around the world. Give us the courage to pray. Uh, give us the nudge to act, um, to tell people that we are praying, to do what we can do um, to support uh, persecuted Christians and others around the world. And as we go from here, we thank you that you go with us by your Holy Spirit. May we remember that as we leave. We pray all this in your holy name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Feel free to mingle, you know, safely. And if you want to buy things, please do. Thank you. Pray.